previously I was in Ephesians and I wasn't done, so I'm taking you back there again. Um, <clears throat> what I did is I set out to apply a principle. If you remember, we were looking at, in the sixth chapter, we were looking at the, the battle and the instructions. And I identified the who in verse 12, not against, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, and so forth. So in identifying those powers, in identifying who Paul is talking to, which is, and for the rest, which some people will say, but this is not applicable to me. So I want to just do something which is very basic to be able to show anyone who is listening to me at this very moment why the whole letter is essentially lining up to show you something about who you were and who you are now. And the reason why this last portion in the sixth chapter is imperative to understand or write the whole letter is set out to tell you who you were and who you are now. So um, I'm going to look at my tablet. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. That's in chapter 2 and verse 1. In 2, 2, he says, you walked according to the world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of dis disobedience. That's who you were. When I say you were, I'm, I include myself. I don't want you to think I'm outside. I'm at the front of the list. But he's saying, this is what you all were to this day. Children of wrath, dead in sins, in times past without Christ. Aliens, strangers, no hope, without God, afar off, against God, at war with him, essentially, because we're told we, we have peace with God now, but the opposite of that is going against him, against God. Sometimes darkness, that's from the fifth chapter in the eighth verse, and then when we get to the passages we're looking at, verses 6, 10 through 18, not aware of a battle. You were not aware of a battle, and if you were, it was irrelevant, inapplicable, mythological, or a flight of fancy. That's what he says you were. That includes me, that includes you, that includes anybody in the sound of my voice. I don't care if you're 101 years old. That's all of us. Romans 3.23 makes it clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is all of us. He says this is who you were. Now, this is who you are. Beginning at 1.1, he says, Saints in Christ, faithful in Christ, blessed in Christ, chosen in him among, for himself, among those who were not chosen, if you will. Now you are accepted in the beloved. Your sins are forgiven through his blood. You have obtained an inheritance, saved, power to us who believe. God is merciful. He loves us. You might think, well, of course I know all this. But when you itemize how much of this points to you, there's a reason why Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 is paramount. The whole letter is going to build to this, but we don't see it like that because we read in chapter and verse. So, we're told, quickened, that's good English, quickened or made alive in Christ, raised with him, we're his workmanship, we are made close, we're drawn to him, the scripture says made nigh by the blood, we're now fellow citizens with the saints of God, household of God, habitation of God, part of an eternal purpose united in his body, given grace. Gift ministers are given to you to complete you in Christ. You've become followers of God. You are light in the Lord, children of light. And I put a little asterisk here. You'll have to tune in later, and I'll explain to you why you are fruit of light, even though that seems to make no sense. It will later on when I do the translation on festival. So for who you are now, you are at war. You're a target, the paragon of what you need to what? Not against flesh and blood, but against all of these forces we have identified. You need this information. Now, if you think about it, I just opened up the whole book and took out what you were and who you are now. So if you understand who you are now, 
called out walking in the light. Think of it this way. You were freed from the prison house, and now all of the ones that run the prison house seek to get you back. They seek to trap you back. So if you put it in that perspective, this sixth chapter talks of a general principle, verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole arm of God, the whole panoply, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. And it is no mistake whatsoever that the apostle starts out with this key, having your loins good about with truth. Now this is why this is so important. I, I have a lament. My lament is, I shared this with you already, I have commentaries upon co every single commentary that you could possibly imagine. And I get very uh, impatient because I, I perceive that people are not looking at this. They, they treat these verses independently and not a part of what I've just done, showing that if you don't realize where you were and where you are now, if, you, if you're still in the, where, the way we were episode of your life, and you don't realize your new standing in Christ, of course, none of these things will make any sense to you. But if you do, then I look at these items in such a way that, as I said, it's my lament that people who are trying to study the Word, they go to uh, commentators who will take some part of this, and then they'll go off somewhere else. But remember, all of these, we'll call them units, are put in here so that we are able to combat the forces that are going to come against you and against me as believers. Now, someone listening to me for the first time, this may, may play on a, on a network somewhere, and somebody will say, well, okay, the forces, like, is that like Star Wars forces? Or, <laughs> really, come on. But I guarantee you, it's what I've said before, the trouble of people in a moment of crisis quote-unquote, surrendering their life to Christ, and no one tells them that at the moment they do that, in sincerity and genuineness, it is like an avalanche from hell will fall on you until you figure out that you're a wanted man or woman. Oh, you know, you're wanted by Christ, but you're equally wanted by the devil. When you get that clear, you come back and you say, okay, the first thing that Paul is saying here is having your loins good about with truth. So why does he start with truth? And aside from that, understanding the certain things that he says, let's, I'll write these down so it'll, it'll make more sense. The first thing that we know from Paul and from other writers, so I'm going to make a combination of things, but the first thing is that you are saved by truth. And that he says in Ephesians 1 and 13, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We are saved by, let's do this, by the truth. So that's the first thing. The second thing, strangely enough, I'm going to use multiple sources here. So that would be Ephesians 1, 13, and we'll put dash 14 because the whole, you need to read as a whole. But somebody else says this similar thing. Believe it or not, James does. In James 1:18. Um, James says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So there's a thing being confirmed, that we are saved by the truth. Now what can I tell you about the truth? Jesus is the truth. He says that in John's gospel, I am the truth. And you begin to understand what ramifications this has when we, we, we think about this. Even back in the Psalms, O Lord God of truth, or even David, who says, Thou desirest truth in the inward part, Psalm 51. So when we think about the truth, I don't want anybody to get confused. I started talking about the commentators because lots of commentators say the same thing. Well, this could be subjective or objective truth. No, friends, it is not. Do not, you know, you can say, well, you, is it an opinion? No, we're talking about if it was only your truth, which you may possess, but your truth is no match for the devil. 
Remember, we're fighting against these forces. You are no match in the flesh. So whatever truth or wisdom you may possess, it is insufficient. Therefore, we must start with the, the clearest thing. When we talk about the truth, we are speaking, and Paul is speaking here of putting on the whole armor, having your loins girt about. I'll get to that in a minute, but let's understand what the truth is. The truth is Christ. And in that particular phrase in the Greek, you'll find the truth is dative. What have I told you about grammar? You, you, you will get lots of color with grammar. Remember, in the Greek, you've got the accusative, you've got the dative, and you've got the genitive case. So dative means on, in, or under. So when we talk about the truth being dative, it means this may seem like a contradiction. How can you put, how can you be girt with truth? And I'll, I'll try and explain this without getting too laborious, but the whole concept is that the truth is placed in you by you being in Christ. Remember I said that's a major theme of the book, being in Christ. So, we understand that we are saved by the truth. The truth is Jesus. I'll take a new page. One of these days I'll just write over my writing, but I'm not there yet. The truth separates. So the truth saves. The truth separates. Now, many people will read the scripture I'm going to quote, and they will not understand what it means. But Jesus, in Matthew 10, 34, he said, Think not that I am come to bring peace but a sword, to put man at variance. Now, what on earth could that mean to somebody who says, Jesus wants everybody to love one another? Well, listen, loving Jesus will bring division in your life. And if you don't believe me, just you start loving Jesus, and you'll find out some people will say, You've gone over the top. I don't want to know anything about you. And that's pretty much, if you understand that, the same words bring life to some and death to others. So the truth brings separation. Let me validate that by another scripture, which is Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17. He says, Father, sanctify them in thy truth. In thy truth, thy word is truth. So thy truth, thy word, and we also know that Jesus is the word. So we just made a full circle here. And then out of that same gospel, John 8, Jesus says, the truth shall set you free. Speaking of the tradition of men. So separating the truth. The truth does many things. You're saved by truth. Truth separates us out. Truth is the foundation of the church. Paul writing to Timothy calls the church it's the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. Which, if you tie that back to other scriptures, Jesus saying, I'll build my church. And even at the beginning of Ephesians, when he says, out called, which is you and me, we've been called out into the light and the word, the truth, and the light all belong together. So when you understand this concept... It is the message of the New Testament, this Jesus whom we preach. It is the message of unity in Ephesians 4. It is the message that Paul says God gave some gifts to the church to perfect the saints, bringing this word of truth, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the truth, to bring you to completion, to bring us all to a unity of the faith, not faith for faith's sake, faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. So, the truth, now you know why Paul begins there with the truth. If you're not starting out with the truth, and I'm speaking of the truth that is in Christ, you are not going to be able to fight. You are a sitting duck. Now, somebody might say, well, what do, what do, what do other people do elsewhere? I don't know. All I know is that this book the whole book, if you do what I just did and make that whole bird's eye view of the way we were versus the way we are now, and you were an enemy of God, speaking of all these forces, you're not going to bother the ones who are still living in the way we were because they still are what they are. You're going to go after the ones who are not, have a firm standing in Christ. Those, that's your prime audience right there. And the ones who are the most eager, well, go for them first. So the truth is important. 
and we talk about the truth. Jesus is the truth. The truth is forever. We've said many times the Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word is the word of God, which is also the word, the Logos, Christ. In the beginning was the Logos. So we have this whole concept. That's why I said, if you go subjective on me and you start thinking, well, uh, I'm a good person and, and uh, I can, well, let me tell you what that will bring you to. That will bring you to being trampled down by the devil, but you won't even know what hits you because it's not a defense. There is no self in this. Once you settle that, now what Paul does say concerning all of these things, this is part of verse 13 when he says, having done all, and I'll come back to this, but I want, I want to show you that all of these action words that Paul is referring to, they all have a similar ending, menoi. They all look the same for a reason. What is being translated in your Bible, having done all, having done, what is being translated, and it's very difficult because the English needs more words than the Greek, but having your and gird about for omitting the loins, um, and regarding your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. All of these... In Greek, they all look, you could see how they all look the same, right? Menoi, they do look the same, yes? Good, the endings at least. Menoi. And that's because, with the exception of this first word, it's slightly different, but all of these occur in the Greek has the middle voice. In English, so this, these are all the same. Middle voice, middle voice, middle voice. For oneself. I am doing this for me. You cannot do it for me. I cannot do it for you. You must do it for yourself. So this one is similar. It just lacks an active voice. So the Greek for you grammarians, this would be called a middle, not middle voice, but middle deponent. If you wanted to know, but you don't need to know that. All right. See, it's just too much information and not enough time to deal with the minutiae of it. So the big picture is this. This is something you must do. So when we talk about putting on the truth, which would be our second word, I want you to think about this concept. We'll break this down for you. So this is what the King James is translating as girt. It's kind of dissected words here. So, peri, which would be with or around, and there should have been an A in there if you can barely see it. Zosomenoi, which would come to a uh, smaller word, which would be to fasten, to fasten, to secure, so, loins conjures up some ideas for us, but what I want to say about this, because I don't want to get too bogged down on this, I want you to think of this passage just like this, that the word loins could be the place of, we'll call it, regenerative power. But more importantly, what is being said is that if you have this all around you and it's fastened, it's not moving, it's not, you know, people use imagery sometimes to say, well, this is in many translations called the belt of truth. Whether you want to call it a belt or you want to call it loins, whatever you want to refer to it as, it's something that goes all around you but is in you. That is the starting point. In other words, Paul doesn't go to say, hey, put on your shoes, hey, put on your hat. He says, put this on first. And there's that reason for it which is exactly um, the nature of which we are, the, the forces we are combating are the opposite of truth. The devil's a liar. He was a liar from the beginning, father of lies, accuser of the brethren. So there's a reason why in this particular instance, truth comes first, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Now you, you fasten yourself in truth. 
Now, there's a, a lot of difficulties in trying to understand this, but a better way is in, there are a few illustrations which will make this more, we'll call it easier to understand. If you'll turn with me in your Bible to Mark 4. In Mark 4, there will be the parable of the sower. In Mark 4.4, 4, it came to pass as he sowed, the sower has seed, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now you've got to go to the explanation, if you will, of the parable, which is in verses 14 and 15, where it says, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So if you understand that concept of holding fast and fastening something, you fasten yourself in the truth because the illustration out of Mark 4 is very simple to understand. The devil does not have vision to see all around. He is not omnipotent, and he is not omniscient. But all it takes is a declaration of faith on the part of some, someone who is eager to hear, to come and listen. And the devil's desire is to take that away. And usually I've seen this be absolute because we're dealing with truth as in the truth as in Christ. The first thing that happens to a person when they listen, when they are, it's something goes off inside like, oh, I I want, to, I want to know more. And believe me, you'll be in the middle of wanting to know more and a spirit of sleep will come over you. Or the phone will start ringing. Or it just keep, and you could say, oh, come on now, but that, that's the way it works. I have had at least these 10 plus years of experience knowing every time I sit down and I'm, I'm bearing down and I don't want to be disturbed, that is when it seems everything, everything that you can imagine comes at me. These are not imaginary things. These are real things. So I'm, I'm envisioning babes, we'll call them youngins in the Lord, coming and hearing and not knowing. And this, this parable, Jesus teaches this parable to say, this is what Satan does. He keeps some from the truth. Remember, we're dealing first with the truth. He keeps some from the truth. Paul puts it another way in 2 Corinthians. He says, if our gospel's hid... It's hid to those who their eyes are blinded over. They cannot see. Why? Because the God of this world has, has blinded them. They, they cannot see. So when you think about it, it becomes very apparent that Satan will seek to thwart the truth, and if he can't prevent you, he'll twist the truth just a little bit. Satan is a master at perverting that truth. When Paul comes to the Corinthians, he has to defend his speech because for these people, perhaps the truth would come with great eloquence and fancy words, and, you know, these are philosophizing people. But he says, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech, and I didn't come to you with wisdom of words. I came to you essentially with the simplicity of the gospel. I came to you with simple words telling you just the bottom line. Now, Satan comes and plants in the minds of people, well, it's got to be more elaborate than this. It's got to be more sophisticated. How could such a simple message affect anybody's life? There's the message of the devil right there. I'm not telling you you have to be stupid to be a Christian. And in fact, there are some people who have so dumbed down the message that you can barely distinguish between what is the pablum and where is the message. But at the same time, let's be clear, Paul was defending this. You don't need anything but the truth. Speak the truth. That's the truth from the Word of God that you need to fight this fight. Now, the truth, aside from all these other things, the truth is that God cannot lie. You know, isn't that a staggering statement? God cannot lie. We are liars. We lie about everything. Women are better liars, I think, than men. liars. Don't get offended at me. That's, we are by nature like that. We are, we are by nature concealing 
liars. Now, I can tell you, even, well, Pastor, wearing makeup's not a lie. Oh, well, it is, kind of. That was a lie, too. Now, don't go self-righteous on me. I'm, I'm just making something for you to grab hold of, which is God cannot lie. We know the scripture, God is not a man to lie. We know that. But there are other places that you can pull from where you, you realize that um, we've studied many of these scriptures that talk about God, who is the God of truth, God who is, he is fastened in his word by two immutable things, the book of Hebrews says, the promise and the oath, God could not lie. So when we think about our standing in Christ and the weaponry that we are wielding, we're talking about an eternal living truth in the written word and in the word as in Christ. So it all comes back to a circle. Why do you think when Paul talks to the Galatians, he says, who hath bewitched you? Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you did not obey the truth? You, you did you were running so well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, Satan is crafty at this. Oh, you mean I have to sit in church and think? Ah, <laughs> oh, that's not fun. Get me out of here. I want to go to the fun church. I want the, the fun mobiles and everything else that's fun about church, but you mean I came here and I have to, I have to think about these things? That there's some, there are some serious issues in the church going on. That's why I said this message, if it's taken in, in right context, you can see why Paul starts with the truth and how easy it is for the church to derail from the truth. Well, we have to stay relevant. In order to stay relevant, we have to talk about things that matter to people today. Who says this? On whose authority? Did Jesus come saying that? No. And that's what drives me crazy is I'm watching people say, well, that's archaic. Well, listen, so is an eternity then by that definition. See, so worried about time, I'm worried about the truth that's in Christ. Because as I am surrounded, fastened, and I must do it for myself, in truth, I use the date of case. Think of what I have received as I receive it in Christ, as I receive Christ, as I receive him as the truth. He is in me. I said the whole theme of this book is being in Christ. So dative, my grammar box, the truth is in me. I put on the truth. Now, this has challenged people. How can you put on the truth for yourself and it not be something that is intrinsic to you? Well, I just said, if it was your truth, you wouldn't stand a second in combating the forces. So we know it is God's truth in you. The next thing we encounter is the breastplate of righteousness. Now this is, it's, it's kind of complex because we read this and without stopping adequately to pause on this, it can become a real hodgepodge of, again, interpretation which leads to error. Here's what I'd like to share with you on this part. We know that when we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, we are talking about not some removed concept, but I want to make this personal so you understand what this, how this might affect somebody. We say, we read in the Bible, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, and to us, for our faith, he imputes his righteousness to me. We know that to be true. If Romans 4 tells us about Abraham, how Abraham amened God, and it was his faith, God counted him as righteousness. It was imputed to him as though he had right standing with God. Now, there'll be people who will interpret this and say, well, it's just something that you put on. Well, you do put it on for yourself. Same idea. You do put it on. You do clothe yourself. But here's the caution. On the backdrop of this, what, why should I understand what this breastplate of righteousness means for me? I'll tell you. Many people come into the church, and they are looking for an experience. Now, unless your emotional experience is hinged in the right place, you are going to be like a druggie, chasing after that high, that first high that you had that was so good. You're going to be forever chasing after it and not 
after the very thing that matters. So the breastplate of righteousness is best understood like this. This prevents me from going in a wrong direction because I understand that everything I stand on is the righteousness of Christ. He not only imputes his righteousness, righteousness to me for my faith and puts me in right relationship with God. For example, we know that he perfectly fulfilled the law and then the curse fell on him that I might stand and live. He took my place. And in the process, he imputes his perfection to me, even though I'm not perfect. It's his perfection he imputes to me. So when I stand in him, and I'm standing, I'm not standing on my merits, I'm standing on what he has done for me. He looks at me and he sees me as perfect, even though I could never be that. But because I'm in Christ, I have this right standing, this right relationship. So the breastplate of righteousness keeps, we'll call it my heart, the breastplate imagery could cover anywhere from under, under the neck right down to cover the groins even. But let's just say it covers my heart and it prevents me from drifting off on things that are not even profitable regarding this, this warfare. Now, if you think about it, the righteousness of God, which is given, imputed, and if I understand that, my whole focus, my whole emotional frame, if there is one, and there is, will be on the reality that Christ died. I will be forever in an emotional state if I'm chasing after one. I don't need to because I recognize the spirit of gratitude and indebtedness. He died for me. He died for me that I might live. Now, why should I go chasing after things that are fleeting, passing, when I have something to really be emotional about, which is I was... I was destined to be condemned to death. I was, de I was given a life sentence, destined to die without Christ. And then he saved me. Now, if you really, that's why I said the way we were, the way we are. If you really believe that's where you were, if you really believe that there was a rescue ever to pluck you from the fire, you don't need to be chasing experiences because you know the only experience you'll ever need is the one that you are reminded of every single day when you wake up knowing there is no ultimate condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. He set me free. He cleansed me. He has forgiven me. Now I feel like I owe my heart and my life to him, not, not under this, you got to do this. This is the law. you got to perform, but rather... I didn't deserve any of this. You ever, you ever gotten a gift you didn't deserve and you just kind of, you're shocked? I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say. It's just like that, except it's perpetual. It never stops because the reality is I don't need to be chasing other emotions. This is the one. Now, yeah. When you, when you and I put on the breastplate of righteousness... What it does is it's something you are putting on to remind you of something he has given to you. And that free gift of God cannot be tossed around. So think of, think of it this way. Now, why, what does this have to do in the setting of spiritual warfare? Here comes the devil with his lies, accuser of the brethren, seeking to pluck you away and to uh, use his methods on you. And you have on the breastplate of righteousness. What does he see as he comes your way? He sees Jesus Christ's finished work in you. He doesn't see your ability, your integrity, your fortitude. He sees Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus won the battle for us, and we still have to go through in this worldly zone. So when people talk about this breastplate, you know, I was going to kind of try and fast forward. I said, no, I'm going to take my time because as you begin to see the nuances of this, you realize Christ gives me confidence to combat. He gives me confidence to stand. He gives me confidence to keep going. He gives me all these things, and I'm no longer like some storm chaser looking for that moment in time. Then I have to keep going to find the next one. I have mine. I have one that can never change. I may change. You know, you wake up some days and you feel real good and you feel, well, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray. And, and there are other days when you, you don't have too much of a spiritual appetite. That's the ebb and flow of our faith. 
But here's something that doesn't change, the reality that I was, I was going to die without Christ had he not called me, the beginning of the book, ex alexito, to himself. And then you begin to think, like the song they sing, why me? What did I ever do that God would deign to rescue me? And you, you put that in that perspective. If you really believe that you were destined to die and destined to wrath, God's wrath, and you realize what God has done, you don't need these other things. And, of course, here comes the devil to attack my salvation. I just read the parable of the sower, Mark 4. Here comes the devil to not only attack my salvation, but my standing. And let me, let me say this, because this really, sometimes it bothers me. There are some of you, I, I love you dearly, but there are some of you that I wish I could, just, I could just take you and say, listen to this and get it in your head. You came to God. You came like every person, the way we were, children of wrath, children of disobedience, children of darkness. Now here you go and I have decided to follow Jesus, right? And you fall off the wagon. You're back in addiction. For some of you, you can't, you can't stop whatever it is. It's your drugs, it's your, it's your booze, it's your food, it's your sex. Whatever it is, you can't stop. And instead of crying out and asking God who came to set the captives free, to deliver those who are caught up and bound, to set them free. Instead of calling out for deliverance, you're busy listening to the devil say, well, you see, you probably couldn't have been saved anyway because you're right back where you were. You're a pig that went right back to your vomit, just as the Bible says. You could not never have been saved. Now, the breastplate of righteousness, even if you fall down, you're still wearing his finished work. When the devil comes to accuse you like he did in Joshua 3, in Zechariah 3, the third chapter, accusing the high priest Joshua wearing dirty garments, God didn't say, well, you're wearing dirty garments representing the people's sin now. You get out of here. He said, put on, put him on new clothing. God did it. And that's exactly why you need the breastplate of righteousness because you will, you and I will, and we do, will wrestle our life long. Some of us, please don't tell me you, you have no wrestling match in your mind or in your spirit or in the things that you deal with and contend with because everyone does. That is our human frame. Now, well, pastor, I don't drink and I don't do drugs and I don't cuss and I don't... Okay. So that means you're perfected. I'm well aware of what happens. Stay in the church long enough and you think, well, I won't... I'm okay. No, it's called, take a spiritual uh, pulse here. And let's be honest, because as I said, it all begins with truth and honesty before God. He desires truth in the inner parts. It's time for me to say, you know what? I've been letting the devil rule me because he's come to attack my standing. Now, some of you may know this better than others because you let him whisper in your ear, well, if you were really saved, you wouldn't be doing this. I want you to consider something that some of you will not listen. I said, I wish I could take somebody to say, listen to this. You won't stop long enough to realize that the very method the devil is using with you is that he's, he's looking at you and he says, you're not covered in Christ's righteousness. You're a filthy pig. You're back in the mud. How could you be saved? There's no hope for you, so just let it go. Plus the fact if somebody else finds out what's going on in your life, they'll, they'll, the, the, you'll, you'll be toast. You're, th that's it. So it's just easier to slide back than it is to say, God will give me the victory. I will, just like Peter, thinking I will cry out, Lord, save me. And here the accuser of the brethren will come, and that's why I said all of these pieces are important. The only way we can fight, we don't have some type of perfection other than Christ. The book of Hebrews talks about we have a high priest who's passed in to the heavens, who is, by the way, so compassionate, he understands, he's touched with the very things we deal with. He knows all about it. He had a face-to-face -face with the devil while he was in the flesh. So believe me, he's seen it all. He knows it all. So this, this, this piece that people tend to think, oh, I don't really need this. 
Now, all of these things point to Christ, but they have a purpose in the battle. So when people say, what do I have to do here? We're looking at, and you can highlight it, you can circle them, but the word truth and righteousness. Now, remember, I said I would, I would translate this for you later, for those of you who are disbelievers. But in the fifth chapter of the same book here, Ephesians in the 8th and ninth verse, he says, For you were sometimes, ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Look at verse 9. King James says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. But really what it is is the fruit of the light, not the fruit of the Spirit. The Greek word photos is there, not pneuma. So a byproduct of the truth, which is the Word, which is Christ, which is the light, which also tags to righteousness, is fruit of walking in the light. Just use a natural example. You know when you're standing right in the middle of a light versus moving to the edge and moving back into darkness where the light is not on you. The fruit of being in the light and walking in the light, he says, righteousness and truth. Think about that. So when you're fighting the lying forces, these are twin items we put on. Now I'll come to, um, I'll come to probably sum this up in one way. It is not your righteousness. It is not something that you possess apart from Christ. And to show an illustration of this, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Acts. There you will see it. Pretty clear, Acts 13. Remember, the design of Satan is to get you away from the truth. If he can't turn you from the truth, will be to attack the righteousness you've received. You are standing. So in Acts 13, we have, beginning at the sixth verse, It's uh, Paul and Barnabas on their travels. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, and desired to hear the word of God. He was called them to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, listen to what he calls him, thou enemy of all righteousness. So I want you to think about that in context of what I'm teaching today that anything that would attack, turn somebody, or try to keep them from, but also concerning this person. He says, he calls him an enemy of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? So I want you to see that in context. And when you begin to see that, these are not just little, sweet little things here, and he calls him an enemy of righteousness, an enemy of Christ. Truth and righteousness will bring you back to Christ. Now, last but not least, this is all I'll get to today. I thought, you know, I have this tendency of wanting to get it all in in one fell swoop, but that's, that just, that's not going to happen. So let's just talk about the feet. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, here's what I say to you. Be Real careful. If you like to read commentaries or you like to read what people have said on this, be real careful because I found at least an average of about 75 people who wrote commentaries on this would tell you that this was a sidebar on evangelizing. 
because of the gospel of peace, and it says that in Romans 10, and therefore how beautiful are the feet of those who come preaching the gospel of peace. Therefore, the, these things must be related. They're not. They're not. They may, this it could have a byproduct of it, but there's a reason why it's in here. Remember, these are all pieces of equipment to fight against the devil. Look, I got shoes. All right. I know, I, can't, I just can't stop myself, though. So, some of the translations um, will read a little differently. Um, Wycliffe's, and your feet shod in making ready of the gospel of peace. The NIV, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Um, the international standard, being firm-footed in. So, what I'd say to you, without getting into a huge amount of grammar and challenging stuff here, so we can just get a concept. Hupo desamenoi. It's complicated because we need different words to translate this. Uh, the, the, the Greek has um, a concept that we probably wouldn't read as clearly or see as clearly than your feet shod with the gospel, with the preparation. So the word for preparation is probably the most key to understanding feet shod. And the word shod, boy, you're going to like this. It's, it, this is a challenging word to, to even try and explain. But hupo can be under, with, bound by. And here's another idea, another pictorial sense for you. This menoi, to to be fitted in such a way. Now, I've heard people say, well, your shoes have to be on tight so you can run. <laughs> that tells you, that's text out of context right there. No, talk about fittings for your feet that let you dig in because you're told to stand. Feet that let you dig in, which means there is something rooted and grounded there. Something, think of, you know, if you... If you see those nice golf shoes or anything that has those things that can pierce into the ground, and think of it that way. We're talking about readiness, preparation, the readiness of the gospel of peace. And why say the gospel of peace? Why not just say the gospel? Because earlier on in this letter, Paul says, he came to preach peace to you that were far off and those that were nigh. And the preaching of of peace is, Dr. Scott used to say, cessation of againstness. But I'd like you to look at it this way. Think of it divided into two camps, the way we were and the way we are. Now, the way we were as children of disobedience and children of wrath and children going according to the course of this world, we are fighting against because we're not in a battle. We're fighting against because we cannot see God. We're fighting against because we're blinded spiritually. That's the war. And on this side, we have the good news of peace. We have received this. Greater is he that is in me. We've received this peace. I know that my Redeemer lives. We've received peace. I know that the Lord conquers all. He has overcome the world. So when we talk about this, don't get confused with, uh, later on we'll talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of, of, of God. But here, think about it as having traction to be able to take that firm stand and not moving. No, don't sing, I shall not be moved. But we're talking about spiritual warfare. So try and think of it this way. The devil who accuses, the devil who sends those fiery darts, the devil who's always looking for some easy place on your being to push you down. Feet are shod. They are ready. They are prepared. They are fitted, dug in, ready to take the blows. And when you see it that way, you understand no one can survive this attack if you're not in the Word of God. You can't. There's just no way. And probably if you're not in the Word of God, the devil doesn't even bother you. So don't even, don't, you know, don't, don't worry about it. But to those people who have come, like the parable of the sower, and they desire to hear, this is the necessary part of putting on, and I've only covered three things, the truth, righteousness, and 
this is a difficult one to summarize, but it's not the gospel of peace so much as the readiness, the digging in part that is that grounds you. That brings me back to what Paul and Timothy said about the church, pillar and ground of truth. Now, if God be for us, who can be against us? If we are so, I'm going to bear down now, but it's not me. It's Christ. Remember, we started out in those words, those power words. It's Christ that gives the strength. It's Christ that gives the power. Do you remember that? Well, then, these pieces, very clearly, it's not just an exercise in putting something on. It's understanding the truth that is in me as in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is my right standing in relationship with him, and my feet are planted in his word, in his truth, righteousness, and goodness, which is what Ephesians 5, 8, and 9 are representing to say, now, when the accuser comes, who is the father of lies, when the, when the accuser comes, who is the enemy of righteousness, who would try to lure you away, maybe even by just trying to push you over. You know, you have, we have these expressions like, you're a pushover. Don't have to work too hard, right? You're a pushover. Well, that's what we are. We are frail. He knows our frame. He knows how fragile. I don't care if you're the strongest man in this congregation. You are still clay, and so am I, and he knows that. So we need these pieces of equipment, and so beautiful. I like the way that Paul will say something in one place, and the other place he will give some other expression that lends not only credence but support to something. Because right here we're told to have our feet firmly readied, if you will, in the gospel of peace. And in Romans 16, 20, he says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now that gave license to people to say, Hey, I just want to check the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> we are pilgrims on a journey. These shoes are not made for running away. These shoes are not made for, uh, you know, it brings me back to something Dr. Scott used to talk about. What is it? Tough shoes for what? Tough well, Think of those tough shoes right now, not iron and brass and heavy duty. I want you to think of them as exactly what I said, able to dig in deep to keep you, when the blows come, and they will, from moving. Now, can you stay like that? Well, only if you stay in him. So what do I want to tell you? How do I want to sum this up? You see all of these wonderful words that we're highlighting, and they can stay words. They can stay pictorial designs from the Bible and how creative Paul was to use this imagery, you can understand that these are all tools starting with the truth. Why do you think Paul in this book, he says, put away lying, speak the truth in love. Why do you think he's saying this over and over again? Think about the way we were and the way we are. Now, there'll be people who will say, well, okay, what, I, I was delivered, I was a child of disobedience, and I'm, now I'm here, I'm in Christ, but maybe I still have these things. Well, doesn't it say that you are his workmanship? God's not finished with you. It's not that it happens in a moment. It's a lifetime. And when you understand that, it makes it perfectly clear. I am going to, and you are going to ha- have to combat these forces, but you cannot do it in the flesh. And you need right understanding of these components. Oh, we'll, we'll get to the above all taking the shield of faith and so forth. But what I'm doing right now is saying, here are these basic elements. They're peppered through the book through this little book of Ephesians, you'll find them if you're really looking about truth and righteousness and an understanding that what Paul was saying was you were delivered from something. Now, there's going to be a battle to have you come back again. And it's not because, listen, Satan and his devices are so crafty. How many times have I been somewhere? People will say, we're having a testimony service. Yeah. We're having a testimony service. You want to come hear the testimony? No. <laughs> Why? Don't, don't, it, I've heard somebody say to me just not too long ago, it's all about the testimony. No. That's a personal situation in your life. And probably the least, I don't care if you've been rescued from drugs, um, gotten out of prison, I don't care what it is. That's the least of the testimony that when you actually read John, in 1 John, he talks about this, and he says, the testimony isn't of ourselves, but it is of God. In other words, if you can't stand somewhere and just talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, everybody has been delivered from something. 
and by varying degrees, and God doesn't care because he sees it all the same way. Now the devil will come and say, hey, come on, let's go hear the testimony because that's, that's what matters right there. I told you, the devil likes to, to just, it's just a little shift, but there's nothing wrong with that, Pastor Scott. No, but it takes the whole shift away. Don't you want to hear what the Lord did for this person? No, not really because he did it for me too and he did it for you. And if you're really honest with yourself and you have a right vision of where you were according to Paul in Ephesians, you're not going to try and lie and say you weren't a child of wrath and you weren't a child of disobedience and you weren't. No, that's exactly who I was before the Lord found me and before he called me to him preveniently. That's exactly where I was. So guess what? That's another way that the devil moves the focus just a little bit off the truth, moves it off of the righteousness of God and puts it on the person again. And that's seemingly so innocent. So if you wonder why I don't do certain things in the church, it's because I recognize all of these things we have to fight against. The main thing is that Christ stay front and center. He is at the core of everything. Our truth, our righteousness. When Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the way, God as our righteousness, as declared by Paul so brilliantly in the first, second, and third, clear into the fourth chapter, talking about a righteousness which is of God, not of man, of God, and the gospel which came by Jesus Christ. And when you understand these things, you recognize the devil despises the idea that someone would stand and say, stand on this truth, Christ is the truth. Clothe yourself in this righteousness because this is the standing that you have in Christ, his perfection, his finished work. And stand now immovable, not you, but what you are shod with, your feet firmly planted in that which has never changed. I am the Lord, Malachi 3, 6 says, and I change not. Same God yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm asking you, if you will do something, which is consider what I've said, even though you've studied this maybe for 20 years or 30 years, go back and look at each of these components and don't look at them in a way that says, no, I'm analyzing this. Analyze it in your own life. Are you standing on anything else but the gospel message? Are you standing on anything else but Christ's righteousness? Are you standing on anything but the truth that is in Christ Jesus? And that, when you analyze that, you answer to yourself and you talk to God about it and you realize, I have something really great to stand on and it's not of me, it's all a gift. It's that same gift that I'm going to do some fierce fighting with. So stand, my friends. Be ready for action. The tools are there for you. I pray you use them. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., if you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.